Okay, so then let's continue. Other big issue which we already talked about is I.O. So we have quite different capabilities regarding I.O. than uh, we have with, uh, with a desktop computer. Um, we can't do precision stuff as well because the, yeah, the so-called fat finger problem where we just cover everything with our finger which we actually want to interact with. Of course, we have less room on the display. Even though the resolution might actually be the same, you can't use the same relative font size on a mobile because then you would need a, a magnifying glass to actually read it. Um, maybe it's not so clear cut a trade off here. So it's not that the size and weight by itself uh, limit the, the available I.O. features. It's just that you have a very different set of uh, features which you have to deal with. So let's look into that for a bit. Uh, biggest uh, input channel at least is usually touch. And the biggest drawback of having touch input is that you don't have any hap haptic feedback. You just have a smooth surface as opposed to a keyboard where you can actually feel the keys. There is some research ongoing uh, to deal with this. So for example, there's this uh, company Tactus, which is building a, a overlay, which you can actually buy and which kind of works again, um, where you can slide an iPad into and then you have these uh, small bubbles, uh, basically transparent bubbles, which you can um, uh, pump some kind of fluid into, which then will pop up out of the, the flat surface and then you can actually feel the keys. Um, but of course, this works only for one single keyboard layout and um, it's, so the bubbles are fixed on the surface. And uh, of course, the whole uh, thing gets a little, a little thicker, so it's not ideal, but it's at least a, a first attempt in, um, into solving this. Then, yeah, we already talked about this a, a bit. We have occlusion. Um, so for example, if you want to use a mobile device which only one hand, then your, uh, the lower part of your hand will almost, almost in, inevitably occlude some part of the display. Um, for that reason, it might actually be a good idea if you design your uh, layout for a mobile application not to put the really important stuff in the lower right or lower left corner because people might actually occlude it. Um, we have that precision issue we already talked about. So you cover stuff um, and you can't really touch very small uh, areas precisely. Uh, that's usually solved by um, using stuff with offset. So you have this menu which is not exactly at the point where you tap, but above. And you also have these handles, for example, which you can use to, to change the selection. Um, so there are solutions for that, but uh, still the, the capability for precision work is generally lower on a touch screen. Also, what you don't have is you don't have a hover state. So you can't, when, with the mouse, oops, with the mouse, I can just uh, put my mouse pointer over something and uh, get, a, get feedback. If my mouse would still work, then I could. Um, I can't do that with a touch screen. This is called the Midas touch problem. Uh, if you ever heard of, of like Greek mytho mythology, there's this King Midas and everything he touched turned into gold, uh, which he liked at first, but if your food turns into gold when you touch it, then it doesn't get so nice anymore. And on a touch screen, everything you touch will trigger an action. So this is the, the parallel being drawn here. And uh, that's often not what you want because if you want, just, just want to see what something, uh, what some interface object does, on a, on a regular desktop, you can just hover your mouse pointer over it and see what happens if you get a pop-up or something. Doesn't work that well on a touch screen. Um, one not quite perfect solution is to simply wait with triggering the action until the touch is released. That way you can at least um, change your mind. You touch something and, uh, oh, I didn't want that at all. Uh, you slide your finger off and release it then, and then no action should get triggered. But yeah, that's not, not quite a perfect, uh, perfect solution. Um, then, of course, we have uh, lots of lots of, of research also going into the direction of interaction with gestures. And uh, there's a couple of additional issues being opened up by gestures. So it's actually quite hard to know just by looking at something what 
kind of gestures you can uh, you can do. And if the gestures are complex, like drawing some kind of symbol, for example, how would you know? Um, again, ongoing research topic, which we're going to look into in more detail, but not something currently available in in uh, yeah, mass market devices. Then this is often called natural interaction. The problem is uh, what's natural is quite different for different people and is also uh, different between cultures, for example. Um, so there have been different, uh, several studies where you ask people to draw gestures for certain operations on a touch screen. And if, uh, so you show people the action you want to trigger and then ask them to uh, make a gesture which they think is most appropriate. And for different people, you get completely different gesture sets for that, actually. So what, you th what people think, what natural means, is quite different. Um, so you don't have also, and for that reason, of course, you don't have really standards for gestures. Uh, for in some interfaces, you, can, you have to tap and hold stuff to, to trigger actions. In, uh, some interfaces you have to swipe stuff to trigger something. In some interfaces you even have to do both. First uh, touch and hold, then swipe, uh, which does another different thing. And you can only basically discover that by trial and error. Um, the one exception uh, sort of is this uh, pinch zoom gesture, which uh, at least when you have something like a map, most people will by now just try automatically more or less, even if the map isn't actually interactive. I've seen that quite a lot, actually. Um, so that is kind of the one universal gesture, thanks to the iPhone, which we've um, kind of universally agree on by now. But everything above that is, is kind of uh, individual preferences. Oh, come on. Okay, so other topic which I'd like to briefly mention is so-called bimanual interaction, which can be either symmetric or bisym uh, asymmetric. Uh, actually, almost everything we do daily is bimanual interaction because we use both our hands. Um, but if in the, in the context of a mobile device, then it makes sense to differentiate between these two these two sorts of bimanual interaction. If it's symmetric, then uh, of course, I can't have any hands available for, for other tasks, but I can, for example, be faster in, in entering text. And if it's unimanual, then I'm, for example, limited by uh, what, my, what my thumb can reach, um, but I can also have the, the kind of asymmetric uh, interaction where I still use both hands. One holds the device and one interacts. So uh, this is kind of related to the usage context, but again, um, it's something I have to take in, uh, into account when I want to design a user interface in this uh, mobile, um, mobile space. Yeah, I already mentioned using just the thumb will probably be quite difficult because uh, only if you have a very small phone or very large hands will you be able to reach the upper left of the device with your thumb without actually uh, uh, getting into the, the danger of dropping it. I think a lot of people have already damaged their screens by trying to reach something in the topmost corner. So also an issue when you have really unimanual interaction only. Okay. Then we have speech, subset of audio. I won't treat audio differently. Um, of course, you can have speech input. Uh, with stuff like Siri, for example, Google Now, and so on. Um, but what's interesting, I think, at least in my personal experience, um, there are all those uh, nice Apple commercials where you can see people talking to Siri and asking it questions and really having a conversation. I've never really seen anyone do that in real life so far, um, or just very rarely that may actually be kind of a cultural difference. So uh, Apple is primarily uh, an American company. And for example, in the US, I've often seen people also uh, talk on speakerphone when they're just walking around the street. Uh, and so 
maybe it's just a cultural difference, but at least in Europe, I really haven't seen a lot of people use, use Siri the way it's shown in the commercial. So speech input is maybe still something that's not as widely accepted as, as, it, as it's supposed to be, at least from the point of view of the, the manufacturer. On the other hand, speech output, um, of course, might be very helpful if you need to do, have hands-free interaction. And the one scenario where this happens the most often is, of course, in the car. And you have navigation, then you usually don't want to interact with the thing a lot and don't even don't want to look at it a lot. So speech output is, is uh, probably the way to go here. But again, uh, apart from these scenarios, I, I feel that speech input and output is not that widely used, at least in Europe. Yeah. Mm. They all have the smartphones too, and for them, the speech input got very important. Because of course. The screen, so this would be another interesting mm -hmm. research. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. Of course, there are people who are limited in some way by what they can perceive, and then uh, it becomes all the more important to use other channels. So that's a good point. Um, and then, you're, of course, you run into the kind of problem you get um, when you have. Uh, uh, for example, an app which is just designed for regular uh, touch input, uh, how can you actually describe that to a blind person in an automated way? So that's a, that, that's a very interesting uh, aspect. Uh, I think I'll try to keep that in mind. And if you get into a later lecture, get into the I.O. stuff into more depth, um, then uh, we'll, I'll try to have a look into that again, too. OK. so. Other channel is motion, which you can again use kind of as output and input at the same time. So motion as output is kind of limited. So you only have the, in, a, in a regular mobile device, you just have the, the vibration alert. And sometimes you can actually encode different, uh, different patterns into the, the vibration to convey different messages. But mostly it's just, uh, uh, look at me, uh, I, I have something to tell you basically from the device. There are, again, research concepts where you have, for example, a, a device which changes size so it really grows thicker if you have more messages, for example. And uh, this is yeah, kind, of, kind of a weird idea, but still, if you have stuff like uh, shape-shifting metals and so on, then this might become viable at some point in the future or where the device kind of, uh, kind of actually moves uh, regularly and the faster the motion goes, the, the more important the messages you have or something like that. So again, uh, not very common, but still a, a research topic. On the other hand, um, you can also use motion as input, of course. Um, so just about any current device has an accelerometer, which you can use to either sense well, you can use it to sense both acceleration and gravity. If you use it to primarily sense gravity, then you can infer the orientation of the device. That's often used by, for example, racing games, so you can just uh, control the game by uh, turning your device. On the other hand, if you look for acceleration, then you can factor out the, the uh, gravity component, and then you can detect relative motions like, like this, for example. But it's always only relative motion. So I don't know where the phone was in the, in the first place. I just know that it's moved uh, to, the, to the upper right, for example, by some amount. Um, but I still can use that as an additional input channel, for example. Um, there's also research, for example, into using uh, secondary devices like uh, smartwatches for input, so uh, that you could actually, so if I, if I now had an additional sensor on my right wrist, then I could, for example, tell uh, how, how steep my finger was when I touched the screen, but simply by, by taking the data from the, from the watch. And then, uh, for example, I could draw with different brush strokes or something like that depending on, on how I hold my finger. Or when I hold it like this, I get a very thin line. And when I hold it like this, I uh, get, a, get a thick stroke, for example. So um, there's lots of different ways of using motion as input. And again, this is an ongoing research field where we'll go into more detail later. Just wanted to give an overview at this point. 
Finally, of course, there's vision, which is actually the most important um, output channel, I guess, on most mobile devices, simply the content shown on the display. Um, on the other hand, we can, of course, also use vision as an input channel by using the camera and combining that with uh, some kind of computer vision technique. Uh, if I directly combine the two, then I get something like uh, augmented reality applications where I uh, basically look at the, at the world through my phone and get additional information overlaid on the, on the real world. Um, in all cases, when I look uh, uh, for the uh, when I look at the display just as an output device, again I have also to take the context uh, kind of into account. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but for example, if you're outside in direct sunlight, then it might become very hard to actually read uh, small uh, small stuff on the display. If you don't have uh, specialized displays which are sunlight readable, but most most generally aren't. So another, another I.O. channel. Um, and you can even have more uh, diverse additional channels. You can, for example, have biosensors. Um, relatively modern devices have fingerprint sensors. You have uh, heart rate sensors and so on. Um, and might be interesting in this context to consider stuff like privacy issues because uh, it might actually be interesting, for example, for some advertiser to know when your heart rate goes up, when, you, when you're watching a movie, for example, uh, to, to sell you even more uh, uh, precisely targeted ads. Uh, for, uh, so this is something to keep in mind. Um, and for the, the really uh, kind of outlandish stuff, which we don't really see a lot uh, currently in regular devices, which is just research for now, is for example um, that we have back of the device touch sensors on the back of the device, so we can actually use the, the rear side as input too. Um, what's rather common is uh, having a notification LED. Then, of course, we have the, the regular location sensor, GPS and so on, which I can use to yeah, determine the, the geographic context. And we have uh, a couple of buttons usually. Um, volume uh, on off, maybe a camera button that's standard for most devices. Um, and for that reason, so I've mentioned this a few times already, we have a very wide range of different I.O. channels. Um, and it might actually be a little too much choice for some things because uh, there comes the issue of discoverability again. Uh, how does the user actually know what they can do? Because they don't want to read like 500 pages of manual first, they just want to start in their acting. But if you can, for example, take a picture by holding the camera button, or you can take a picture by opening the app, or you can take a picture by swipe, doing some kind of swiping combination on the start screen, um, it might at some point start to get confusing for the users what they can actually do and what, what does what in, in which context, basically. All right, so I hope I haven't been talking for too long. A little more time is left. So this was about I.O. Summary of the issues we're going to, to look into. Are there any further comments or questions uh, up to here regarding input and output in general or interaction in general? <laughs> 